When people develop autoimmune thyroid disease, which is they develop um, antibodies to the thyroid gland, what usually happens is those antibodies beat the gland up and stop it working normally. But we know in some instances, those anti antibodies, rather than beating up the gland and stopping it from working, they actually have the effect of flicking a switch on the thyroid gland and work, making it work over time. And this uh, results in a condition called Graves' disease or autoimmune hyperthyroidism. And uh, as indicated, the antibodies that are generated as part of the autoimmune process, they stimulate the thyroid gland and make you produce excess thyroid hormone. And individuals with this condition can present with actually a range of symptoms and signs to a whole host of different doctors actually. We know that you can get tummy symptoms and signs, you can get a rapid heart rate, so you can present to heart doctors. It can sometimes alter your mood as well and you can present to, for example, to psychologists and psychiatrists because you're uh, not the person that you were beforehand. So excess thyroid hormone Classically, this entity called Graves' disease can present in a, in a host of different ways, but the key feature when you measure the thyroid hormone levels in the bloodstream is the levels are high. And I often see or view Graves' disease as a, a significant nuisance condition in that in a perfect world, you present with a condition, you take a tablet and uh, it'll go away, but Graves' disease isn't really like that and um, it's a a bit of a long haul for many people having Graves' disease because there's no uh, quick fix. And the standard treatment for Graves' disease is to take a tablet called carbimazole uh, in the UK which reduces the thyroid gland for thyroid hormone concentrations to normal. So you take the, the um, so-called anti-thyroid drug called carbimazole and it slows the thyroid gland down. And we know that if you take this medication for maybe a couple of years that there is a chance that when you stop it that the overactivity will have gone away but whilst in adults the likelihood of it going away might be 50 50 in young people unfortunately the likelihood is uh, only maybe 20 25 percent so a lot of people who take these medicines they will take it for two or three years but that does not result in a cure and I guess the additional problem for a young person on this antithyroid drug carbimazole is that you're a bit more likely to get side effects as a young person and an older person as well. So in other words, not only does not does it not work as well in the long, ter long term, but it also is more likely to be associated with side effects. So it's a bit of a pain actually if you're a young person with, with Graves hyperthyroidism. I guess for the person who's on antithyroid drug for a couple of years and stops them and it comes back, they're faced with one of um, like essentially three choices really. You can either go back on the antithyroid drug and there's nothing to stop you taking it for a lengthy period of time. And indeed it may be that the longer you take it, the more likely it is that you, when you stop it, that the thyroid gland's going to behave itself. But, you know, ultimately a lot of people uh, get a bit fed up taking the carbimazole and some people are seeking other options. And the two big treatment options if you get fed up taking antithyroid drug are both treatments, two treatments that effectively get rid of the thyroid gland. One is surgery, removing the whole thyroid gland, total thyroidectomy it's called. And the other uh, treatment is radioiodine, which means taking a, 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 radio, a, a radioiodine drink or in young people who are in their teenage years, typically a tablet. And because the thyroid gland is the only tissue that metabolizes iodine, the iodine tablet goes straight with its associated um, radioactivity to the thyroid gland. And uh, in, over the course of the next few months, we'll, uh, we'll essentially get rid of, of the um, overactivity. And it's worth talking, I think, about the two treatments and the pros and cons in um, more detail. If I was a salesperson for, a, for, a, um, for the operation, I'd say surgery is great. If you've got a big gland, it's a good way of getting rid of it. It uh, works straight away. And in the right hands, it's a very, very, very 
safe procedure. As long as it's done by a surgeon who does the operation regularly, it's people are certainly in the hospital where I'm based, people are in one day and out the next. But there are risks of surgery which you can't totally ignore. That we know that, in, that of course people get a scar in their, uh, in their neck. That fades with time, so a few years down the, the line it may be very difficult to see. But the, uh, of course there are other, um, well certainly if you read around the subject you will hear of two other significant problems that are rare but need to be mentioned by the, uh, by the team um, before. Well, they need to be at people's fingertips before they embark on the operation. And the, the first is the fact that occasionally in maybe 1% of instances, there may be a change in the individual's voice long term because the nerves that control the voice run very, very near the thyroid gland. And even in the best hands, very occasionally there will be a change in your voice. So that I guess if you're planning a career as an opera singer, then it's probably not the preferred um, course of, uh, of action. The other side effect is that there are four glands that control calcium levels at the back of the thyroid and sometimes they get damaged in the, uh, during the surgical procedure and typically in the short term any calcium problem, because these glands control calcium levels in the bloodstream, they're called the parathyroid glands, and if you damage them then you're at risk of having a low calcium. And if they are damaged, it's typically a transient problem. It comes, maybe may, well, may an issue for a few days, but then it goes away. But occasionally it can be long term. So it may be one to two percent of people who have a thyroidectomy, a thyroid gland excised, they may get, they may require a long, long term calcium or vitamin D supplementation. If you make somebody effectively hypothyroid by taking out the thyroid gland, then you have to be on thyroid hormone replacement for life. So the problem with both these treatments, radioiodine and surgery, is that you're heading down, uh, you're heading for a life where you take th where you need to take thyroid hormone on a daily basis, which for many people is not a particularly big deal, but of course in a perfect world you'd not have to take tablets at all. So surgery, popular amongst um, uh, some nations, some units in the UK are very big fans of thyroidectomy as a definitive treatment for Graves disease. But of course there is this other option, radioiodine, which is, um, has been a, a favoured treatment in the US for a long time. There's a lot of data from the United States about radioiodine treatment in young people. I think people don't see it as an option in the very young child, or except under exceptional circumstances, but it's great because you go in, uh, typically having stopped your anti-thyroid drug for a few days, take your tablet and within a relatively short period of time um, you will become, um, firstly the overactivity will settle and then in the long term you become underactive and again need thyroid hormone replacement in the long term. And I guess if I was a salesperson for radioiodine I would be saying great, you know, no need for an operation, you go in, have a tablet and then you're out. But on the downside, and there are, I guess that you'd argue there are probably two key downsides, I think. Um, the first is that in the first two weeks after the radioiodine treatment, there were rules and regulations about who you need to mix with. You can't, for example, be very, very close, for example, to your baby brother for uh, every, uh, day in, day out for the next fortnight. For many young people, that's a big plus, not being next to your uh, baby brother or sister. And um, and of course, uh, that is just a short-term issue. Um, but it does mean for many people that a good time to have radioiodine treatment is during, for example, during holiday time, because you do have to be off school for a couple of weeks at the, after radioiodine therapy. And the other thing that people obviously will think about is, well, what does it do to your body having this radioactive iodine? And uh, people think about does it um, increase the likelihood of you being infertile? And the data on that is very, very reassuring. It doesn't affect fertility in ladies who have this treatment. And of course, it's largely ladies that get autoimmune thyroid problems. And um, the other issue of people worry about is, is, well, will it cause any kind of cancer? And we know that 
uh, in the long term that actually treating someone with Graves' disease with a, with a respectable dose of radioiodine, it removes the thyroid gland, so there's no gland there to get cancer. But there is this uh, ongoing uh, discussion about the uh, long-term effects on the likelihood of people getting lumps and bumps. And I think that it's fair to say that uh, the, most of the data is very, very reassuring on that. Um, but there are undoubtedly studies that have shown that if you get exposed to radiation in early life, that if you follow these people up, young people up for long enough, there may be an increase in likelihood of getting certain types of, of cancer. But the advocates of radioiodine will say, well, hang on a minute, you know, what's the likelihood, the absolute likelihood of you getting a cancer? And the absolute likelihood is very small, very small. But it's, um, and you, some people will say, well, hang on a minute, you know, the likelihood of people being in a road traffic accident and being hurt in a road traffic accident or being involved in some other kind of accident is, is probably far greater. But many people will still say, well, actually, there is this risk there. And I think a lot of the, um, if you like, scientific community at the moment are, are trying to work up ways of quantifying that risk in people so you can give more accurate information about just what that risk is. But both surgery and radioiodine, great treatments, both get rid of the thyroid gland, but the downside long term is both require thyroid hormone replacement.